Good morning, and welcome to Maps for Good, or what I think of as maps that matter. Because it turns out that maps are not only useful for navigating from point A to point B, but can also be very powerful tools to make the world a better place. My name is Rebecca Moore. I'm engineering manager at Google for Google Earth Outreach and Google Earth Engine. And uh, I'm pleased to have on the panel Dave Thau, who's developer advocate for Earth Engine, and two uh, of our lead developers from nonprofit partner organizations, Kevin Bluer from Access Map and Jake Wall from Save the Elephants. Developers have a very important role to play in leveraging Google Earth, Google Maps, all of our mapping tools to make the world a better place working with nonprofits. For me, this all started personally back in 2005 in my community in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Google Earth had just come out two months earlier. I opened the mail, and this is what I received. My neighbors and I got this map in the mail. What does it say? Notice of intent to harvest timber. This is in the Santa Cruz Mountains, above Los Gatos. There are these, uh, the legend says, hmm, non-industrial timber management plan area is in uh, bordered by black lines. Not terribly helpful. Uh, there are helicopter landing sites that are circles. Um, I'm a map person. You're all map people. But you can imagine that this was difficult for most of my neighbors to understand. And so most of them simply threw it out. They just threw out this public notice, which was maybe the intent of the senders. But I was concerned because it sounded like logging did not sound like a good idea. And so I thought, what would happen? And again, Google Earth had just come out two months earlier if instead of this black and white map, I tried to figure out the elements of this plan and remapped it instead on Google Earth. So first, I found this location on Google Earth. And it looks like this. Well, that's immediately a whole lot more helpful to understand what's going on. And then, as I said, I took those elements of the plan and I remapped it. From this, I was personally shocked. And when I showed it to my neighbors, they were shocked, because it became evident that this was a very long, five mile long swath of over, over 1,000 acres of uh, old growth redwoods that would be cut, where the logging would go right up next to schools, daycare center, elementary school. Helicopters would be landing and taking off in perpetuity over these playgrounds and so on. Just having the high resolution data and the spatial uh, information together made that much more clear. Of course, seeing it in 3D is even better, and using SketchUp models of, of helicopters, again, this could make clear to, to people what was at stake. So I, it was a little bit like Al Gore. It was right when that period of an inconvenient truth when Al Gore was going around giving slideshows everywhere. I was trudging, not through the snow, but trudging around to different communities, to the media, to politicians who wanted to understand this plan better than they could from those grainy black and white maps and a 400-page plan. Um, and in fact, what people stated, and you can see this here, has come up again and again and again since then. Things like, I thought I was well informed until I looked at this in Google Earth. And this three-dimensional presentation gave an amazing topographic bird's eye view of how invasive the logging will be. So that began the sort of <coughs> seeing is believing that uh, uh, for public benefit. The media picked this up as well. But tonight a battle is brewing in the South Bay over plans to log a thousand acres of land. Tony Russomano shows us exactly what's at stake. We're taking a Google Earth virtual flyover along a five mile length of Los Gatos Creek between Lexington Reservoir and Lake Ellsman in the Santa Cruz Mountains. The area in red, totaling 1,000 acres, is land that San Jose Water Company wants to log. The map was created by a software engineer who lives in the area, and it's being used to galvanize opposition to the company's plan. The point was, instead of it being abstract roads and so on, you could see it with your own eyes. And it changed a, an abstract concept to something that was quite concrete. Eventually, using Google Earth, we were able to prove that this logging plan was not only a bad idea, but it was, in fact, illegal. And to my knowledge, this was the first grassroots environmental application of Google Earth. 
Um, so we stopped the logging. And now, in fact, uh, thank you. <laughs> Yay! Uh, and now, in fact, the area is being considered for public open space and, and permanent protection. So that started getting a lot of attention uh, around the, the blogosphere and, and media. The Wall Street Journal wrote this article, activists start Googling, you know, internet maps illustrate environmental woes. People were saying instead of climbing trees and doing tree sits, environmentalists are sitting in front of Google Earth, and that's how they're making a difference. People started uh, uh, writing to me, and I was just a Google engineer working on Google Earth, but all these environmental groups all over the world started writing to me saying, um, can you teach us what you did uh, so we can do the same thing? So I started Google Earth Outreach, our program to help nonprofits, as a 20% project. It's grown. Members of our team are here. We've worked with more than 2,000 nonprofits around the world. Um, and it turns out that although they are able to use our tutorials and they are doing a lot of fantastic work on their own, some of them need help from professional developers, like you guys. So by the way, that's our URL. Please check it out. So back in 2011, we started a developer grants program where we specifically awarded ten dollars to $20,000 to a number of nonprofits, actually 16 different nonprofits, to dedicate to hiring developers to build these cutting edge visualizations of their campaign uh, in Google Earth. These are some of the projects that have come out um, in this last year. Um, I love the Atlantic Public Media. You should check it out. Who would think that you could get emotional about Arctic tern migration? But I guarantee you it will bring a tear to your eye. So uh, again, I encourage you to check this out. You can imagine that if we did a round of grants in 2011, there may be an announcement we have coming up at the end of the talk today. So please stay tuned. I'm just going to show you a couple of these projects that resulted from the developer grants in 2011. And uh, here's one. Eyes on the Forest with World Wildlife Federation. This is the developer is David Trees. They're using Google Maps Engine. And we now have a grants program to give Google Maps Engine for free to registered nonprofits to show the change in forest that's happening in Sumatra and how that relates to shrinking tiger habitat. All these data layers are in Maps Engine. So looking at these two, the green area is 1990 forest cover, and the orange surrounded gray area is where suitable tiger habitat. You can see there's a very strong correlation between forest and tiger habitat. Then you can see in 2000, the forest cover is shrinking, and you can see the tiger habitat now uh, uh, is exposed where there's no forest. Let's go a little further forward in time. 2007, further shrinking of forest. This is rampant deforestation in Sumatra due to palm oil plantations. So finally, that's where we are in 2009. And now if you project where tigers can now live, it's like that. So it's a very visual way to illustrate uh, the driving of species toward extinction uh, by uh, virtue of land use changes. A second um, really important project, this is by the Halo Trust, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to eradicating landmines around the world. They use Google Earth Pro to document which areas still have mines and are dangerous and need to be cleared. You see those in red. And which areas have been cleared in green and are safe for people to return. Here's an example. In 2002 in uh, Kunje, uh, Angola, um, these areas in red were too dangerous. And you can see the area is not settled at all. No one lives near there because, uh, because of these dangers. Now fast forward to 2011. Those areas have been cleared of landmines. And now people, villages are returning. Uh, it's safe for children to walk to school. With their developer grant, they built a Google Earth tour, an animated tour that's actually narrated by Angelina Jolie that shows more than 70 million landmines on the border between Cambodia and Thailand um, and makes very evident you know, what's at stake uh, and why these issues are important. This is um, more than 70,000 displaced people could return to their homes after these mines were cleared. And today, they're growing 
wheat, vegetables, and grapes. The last example I want to show you before turning it over um, is cultural mapping. I think this is a really important future frontier. If you guys are interested in indigenous culture, there are thousands of tribes all over the world who are not on Google Earth and Maps today. Um, their cultures are not well mapped. And many of them would like to get on the map. So in particular, Chief Almir Surui from the uh, Amazon, uh, Brazilian Amazon approached us in 2007 and asked us if we would help uh, document uh, the uh, illegal invasions of, the, of his territory that are happening and help them put their culture on the map. Working with um, our team, also with an outside developer, uh, we just launched this uh, a week or so ago. Um, more than uh, almost 300 place marks that tell where they hunt, where they fish, where they gather the wood for their arrows, the site of first contact. Um, it's narrated, some of the tours, by the Surui youth. And uh, I can tell you that tribes all over the world are contacting us because they want to do the same. So if you as developers are interested in that, please come talk to us. So to wrap it up, what are the themes that we've been seeing in these first few years of Maps for Good? First of all is seeing is believing. You can show a politician charts and graphs and their eyes glaze over, but you show them the issue in Google Earth and Maps, and in a minute they can get the issue and you can make a change in policy. Groups like Halo Trust are using it to actually run their day-to-day -day operations. And finally, maybe the biggest thing is people are using it to raise awareness, to inspire donors, to inspire volunteers, and actually uh, make a change, make, make the world a better place. So with that, we're going to turn it over. You're going to hear from Dave Thau, who's going to talk about a next generation platform that our team has developed called Google Earth Engine, which is petabyte scale analysis of satellite imagery. Um, Kevin Bloor, who's going to talk about Access Map, and Jake Wall. Take it away, Dave. Thanks, Rebecca. So I'm Dave Thau. I'm a developer advocate on Google Earth Engine, uh, which means my job is to work with developers who are creating applications to run on the Earth Engine platform, uh, which I'll tell you about now. Uh, this is, yes, ah, Google Earth. So who here uses Google Earth? Yeah, all right, so you know it's a great application for visualizing Earth data and also collaborating. But one thing it's not really designed for is doing uh, analysis of, of Earth data. And we've gotten feedback from people saying, hey, Google, you have a lot of geo data and you have a lot of computational power. Why don't you give us the tools that we need to be able to do analysis on your data? And that's what uh, Earth Engine was developed for. Um, so let me give you some examples of what I mean by analysis. For one, uh, the United Nations last week had a conference on sustainable development. Um, the qu one of the questions there is, how can we minimize the environmental impact of growing our population by two billion people? And one of the approaches to that is to only develop in places that are already developed. Don't develop in new places. So if there's not a road someplace, don't start sticking roads there. So we were, uh, leading up to the conference, we were approached by a member of the European Parliament who said, hey, Google, you have lots of road data. Can you create for us a map of the roadless areas? And so we used the toolbox that we've been creating to create this map. So this is a map globally of all the areas that are um, one kilometer away from roads uh, or nearer. So the white areas are the ones that are right on the roads. Uh, and there's a gradient lead that goes off from there. So you can see uh, down in Brazil, um, there are lots of areas that don't have roads, but then there are these funny little guys down here. These are little road networks um, that are disconnected from everything. So it's kind of interesting what's going on there. Um, and you also easily see that places like um, Alaska, where you'd think that there are lots of places where are no roads, are highly developed. So there are lots of roads here. So at a glance, you can look at this map and find out where the roadless areas are. And this involved analyzing all the road data that we have, which is you know, millions of kilometers of roads. So another kind of analysis is um, deforestation detection. So here is the Surui territory that Rebecca mentioned. Um, you can see that it's pretty well protected. Uh, this is their territory. All this is deforestation. And you can see on the edge there are little incursions of deforestation. And so you might want to ask, 
when did those get there? Are they growing? How fast are they growing? Um, and these are good questions to ask, and you need to have access to data to answer them. Now, there's an underutilized feature in Google Earth, which is the historical data button, a little globe up here with an arrow. And with this, when you click on this in Google Earth, you get a timeline, and you can actually go back to historical data that's in Google Earth. Um, but these are snapshots. They're really nice images that we've gotten from satellites. Um, but it's only, you know, every once in a while. So this picture was taken in 2009. Uh, here's the next earliest one, a couple of months later, uh, earlier in 2008. And then going back in time, this is the earliest image we have. So it's hard to look at those data and be able to answer the question, like, how fast is it growing and when did it get there? And so this is what we've developed Earth Engine for, to give developers the ability to ask those questions. So here's a Earth Engine in a nutshell. Um, there are a couple of components. One is we've been downloading lots of satellite data and other sorts of data sets that you might want access to. And I'll talk about that in a second. On top of those data, we have an API that lets you programmatically access the data and run algorithms using it. And when you run the algorithms, they run on the Google cluster. And also using the API, you can build applications. So we have some applications that we ourselves have built, and we're also working with science partners and NGOs to build other applications. So here's a little bit about the data we have. We've been downloading entire sets of satellite data. There is a series of satellites called Landsat that have been going since 1972, and we've been acquiring that whole catalog. So we have 40 years of historical data. Most of it is daily data, so daily up to 40 years. Um, we're getting the satellite data as it comes in daily, and we have other data sets. So we have elevation data, atmospheric data, and uh, as developers need more data to do analyses that they think are important, we will be adding those data as well. Now, an interesting thing about the data is it's full satellite data. So in Google Earth, what you see is red, green, blue imagery taken from you know, lots of different kinds of satellites, but cleaned up and nicely displayed so it looks really good. What we have in Earth Engine is the raw satellite data. Uh, and you can do interesting things with it. So here we have the electromagnetic spectrum. Ready for science. Uh, so <laughs> at, you know, here's some um, low wavelength electromagnetic spectrum, and it goes down to radio waves, which are longer wavelength, and the visible spectrum, where red, green, and blue live, are in the middle. So the satellites that we tend to use use not only the visible spectrum, but also a lot of stuff in infrared. Uh, so Landsat, which I mentioned, has uh, eight bands, Landsat 7, so I'll talk about just some of them. So the first three bands are blue, green, and red. So that's what you see in Google Earth. But then, in addition, there are infrared bands, and there's also a thermal band, so you can measure heat. So what's nice about this is you can combine these bands in various ways to see things you wouldn't normally see if you just had RGB. So let's just take RGB. Here's an image around Yosemite. If you haven't been to Yosemite, go to Yosemite. It's stunning. It looks a lot better than this. Uh, this is recent. This is taken not so long ago. Uh, actually, no, this is a little bit uh, more towards the winter. But it's hard to see what's going on. There's, the, there's snow, there are clouds, somewhere in here there's land, but it's hard to see, right? If you're interested in vegetation, you can't really get it from this. But if you're interested in vegetation, you can look at a combination of these bands, the red band and the near IR band. And when you do that, the vegetation pops out. So from the same image, using these different bands, uh, you can see the vegetation here, the little less vegetation here, and no vegetation here. And similarly, if you're interested in clouds uh, and water, or snow and water, um, you can use a different set of bands, and snow and water pop out. So with this additional information and the ability to analyze it, you can get to a lot of uh, features that you weren't able to with just RGB. Now, to, so that's the data. Now, to analyze the data, to access it, we have an API that we're building. The uh, API is currently in trusted tester mode. I'll give you an email address to write to if you're interested in testing it out. So this is not the actual API. This is uh, JavaScript. I mean, this is a pseudocode. Um, but we have two APIs, a JavaScript one and a Python one. And here's an example of the kinds of things you can do pretty easily. Um, so here's Landsat 7. I'm grabbing the Landsat 7 catalog here. I'm filtering it down to just 2011 here. And here I'm doing something pretty cool. I'm taking the median of every pixel in the stack of images. 
So Landsat 7 circles around every 16 days or so. So in a given year, you might get like 20 images of the same spot. So here is the Bay Area. Um, so you get 20 images stacked up. And for each pixel, in each band, you figure out the median value and you bring it up to the top. So that's what median does. And that helps change an image from this. So this is kind of a noisy Landsat 7 image. There are funny stripes, there are clouds, there's all kind of stuff going on. Just by applying median and displaying it on map, you get a much cleaner image. And so there you go. Four commands cleans up this and gives you this. And the nice thing about the API is it's designed to run in parallel in the Google cluster. And that lets us scale very well. So show you what, how that works. Let's say you want to do some deforestation detection on an image like this. What we do is we farm, we divide the image up into little bits, and then we farm it out to lots of different computers. And if you went to the keynote, you can imagine how many computers you could farm these things out to. 600,000 cores, yes. Uh, then you process the image and recombine it, and you're done. So this allows us to scale to very large, to, from states to countries to continents to global analyses. One thing we did was this uh, Mexico forest map. This is the highest resolution map of forest in Mexico right now. The Mexican government is validating it. Um, it was 18 terabytes of data. Uh, it took 15,000 hours to compute, which would be years on a single CPU if nothing went wrong, and it always does. But it took us less than a day. It took us about 14 hours uh, because we were able to spread it out over lots of computers. And the analysis, we worked with our science partner, Matt Hansen, uh, to do this. So it's his algorithms to compute it. And it took data. Um, here's, here's Cancun. Um, it took data that looked like this. So this is actual Landsat 7 data. Clouds, missing data, it's a mess. And turns it into, into this. So this gives you a much clearer idea of where the forest is in this area. So that's one example of things we can do. We are also building applications. So we have some of our own, and we're working with partners um, to develop others, and they are using the API to do that. So here's one application that we're building. It's a classification engine. Uh, you can create mosaics, composites of Landsat data, and then you can train up a classifier. So we're piggybacking off the Google Prediction API for this. You can plop down some points, some classes, so this is forest, this is not forest. You can upload data sets, you can upload already classified images, and then you choose a classifier, so fast naive Bayes, and you hit classify, and in seconds you get a classified map. Uh, so this is, this is an application that we're rolling out to trusted testers also, and the um, email address I'll give you is, will give you access to this. And the last thing I'll talk about is an application that we're building with a part, an NGO, uh, called Amazon. So Amazon is doing uh, deforestation monitoring in Amazon. They have monthly reports that they issue with how much deforestation has happened, and they're a watchdog group uh, that works with, uh, that, you know, compares their results to the Brazilian government. Um, they have a desktop system they've been using, but it takes them about a month to do a month's analysis, and it's just the Brazilian Amazon. So they want to scale it up. They want to scale it to the rest of the Amazon and more globally. And so to do that, they've ported it over to Earth Engine. Um, next month, they're going, they're going, they're shifting completely over, and they're going to start, they're going to be doing the reporting from Earth Engine. And this is an application we've built um, with them, built on the API. It's an HTML5 application. It uses Canvas. Um, you can do things like change thresholding um, to change the sensitivity for deforestation and degradation detection, and it's, it's pretty snazzy. And they say it's cutting their time for analysis in, in half from what they have already. So to close, Earth Engine gives you lots of satellite imagery and lots of other kinds of data that you might want to use in analyses, and API for analyzing those data, and the ability to run it over the Google cluster. Uh, thanks very much. Here, if you, if you want to play with the API and the, that uh, classifier, here's the email address to write to. If you do write to it, please give some description of what you'd like to do. Um, we're, we're still working out the details of the API, so we're you know, rolling it out slowly to trust the So if you give us an idea of what you want to do, that would be great. Thanks very much. And, <laughs>
now I'll turn things over to Jason De Silva, who will talk about um, Access Maps, another Mapping for Good project. Hi, my name is Jason De Silva, and I'm the founder of Access Map. I have multiple sclerosis, and getting around <laughs> can be a challenge. So, I came up with an idea. Hi, my name is Jason, and I use a scooter to get around. It's not so easy. I have trouble going to stores, finding bathrooms that are accessible, and meeting up with friends. Of course, I can call ahead, but many places say they're accessible, but really, they're not. There has to be a better way. So I had an idea. What if everyone could share all the accessible places they know? And what if all this was put on one map? And that map was available on the web and mobile phones. I call it Access Map, an online and mobile app where anyone can search for accessible places or review them on their entryways or bathrooms. Access Map opens up a whole new world of choices, and I can instantly find all the accessible places around me where to eat, shop, grab a coffee, or get a haircut. Even if you're not in a wheelchair, you're invited to give ratings and contribute. Access Map is powered by you. The more you review, the better it gets. For people with canes, walkers, or wheelchairs. Even moms and dads with strollers. Access Map is your ticket to mobility freedom. It's easy and free to use. Help make this world a more inclusive one. Join the movement today. Check it out. AccessMap.com. So that's Access Map. And just to give you a little bit of context, accessibility is not just about convenience, it's a human right. <clears throat> and with that, I'm going to hand you over to the developer of Access Map, Kevin Bluer. Okay, hi guys. Uh, my name's Kevin Bluer, and that was, as you just saw, that was Jason De Silva, who's the founder of Access Map, and as he mentioned, I'm one of the uh, developers. Um, so I'm just going to start with a, a few screenshots of Access Map, just to give you a flavor of, of what we've built. Um, so here is the uh, search results screen. Um, <clears throat> on the left, you can see the results, obviously. And um, we've got the kind of two measures there, so getting into a venue, uh, and then once you're inside the restrooms, they're the kind of two key measures, uh, and we'll go into some more in a moment. And on the right, you can obviously see the, the map. That's actually Jason's neighborhood in Williamsburg, uh, Brooklyn, in New York. Um, and already you can see a few colored pins there, which is great. You know, one of the goals of this is to actually be able to you know, see before you go or, or while you're on the go as well, seeing uh, venues that are accessible uh, around you. Uh, this is a, um, a venue page. Uh, and as you can see, in terms of the same results, the two kind of key measures, so getting into that venue, uh, and then once you're inside, as I mentioned, the restrooms, we've got six additional attributes in the kind of middle of the screen there, these six tiles that you can kind of click on when you're adding a review. Uh, and that's, you know, things like spacious once you're inside the venue, whether they've got an accessibility ramp, uh, accessible parking, braille menus, et cetera. In the top right as well, you can see uh, the, uh, we've embedded Google Street View, which I know Jace used to use um, prior to, you know, this tool existing, just to get a glimpse from the outside, just to see, you know, how accessible the venue is. Now it's obviously embedded in this tool, so a great use of uh, a Street View there. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> this is just adding a review, quite simply. You can see the you know, kind of bigger emphasis on kind of chunkier icons to make the actual application a little more accessible. And you've got the stars and uh, the tiles when, you, when you're adding a, a review. And then obviously comments. And then just lastly, in terms of the examples of the screen. So this is a little slow, just clicking through. Okay, yeah. Uh, and this is just the, the, the mobile uh, app as well. We both have both a, a mobile web version and an Android version and you know, an iOS version in the works too. And you can kind of see we've got parity there between uh, the, the main web uh, and mobile web and, and, and native apps as well. Um, so stepping back, you know, in terms of, of building the application, in terms of the kind of setting out some of the goals when we, when we sat down to kind of build this, um, we obviously want to make the application easy to use, of course. Um, broad appeal, so as Jason mentioned in the, in the animation there, um, everything from, you know, a mother with a, or mom or father with a stroller through to, you know, someone, uh, user of a wheelchair. 
um, <clears throat> and then actually making the application itself accessible. So we've kind of got uh, you know, big emphasis on um, uh, bigger kind of fonts and icons, in, in, as you saw in some of the screens, uh, you know, white on black fonts, um, going for a you know, big emphasis on like compliance, WCAG compliance in the actual app itself. Um, in terms of when we were building it as well, we actually built out a number of um, interactive wireframes, used Balsamic mockups. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but that's a, that's a great tool for actually kind of mocking up the application. We actually got Jason using the app and, and some of the other folks in the community to actually sort of play around with it before we started the build. Um, so that was very useful. Um, in terms of the technology stack as well, um, on the back end, in terms of the APIs that we, can, uh, we call, um, on the Google side, we use um, Places API. Um, as you saw, we use the, you know, the, the maps. We've embedded Street View as well, so great use of the you know, great services. In terms of our stack, um, it's MongoDB, uh, Node um, <clears throat> in, in, on for, the, for the web server. And we also have our own API, which I'll come to in a moment as well. And in terms of the clients, um, for, the, you know, for the web clients, usual kind of suspects, so HTML5, CSS, and script. And we actually, you know, for the native apps, we actually used um, PhoneGap, or as it's now called since it's been open sourced, uh, Cordova, uh, which I'll come to in a moment as well. In terms of some of the sort of technical design decisions when we're, when we're building the tool, um, I mentioned we're using Node on the, on the web server, or sort of app server, um, which essentially led us to kind of having JavaScript everywhere. Um, it's my first project with Node personally, and uh, a great experience. I'm not sure, I'm obviously it's a technical crowd, so I'm sure a lot of you have familiarity with it. Um, and yeah, and it was, it was great. It's, it's definitely something to be said for the elegance of having you know, JavaScript you know, across the board right through to the, the, the data that comes out of the, the, yeah, the Mongo, of the database um, in this case. Um, and in terms of Cordova or PhoneGap as well, um, again, personally, that was my first experience with it, but it was you know, a, a great uh, stack. And I think it, one of the sort of takeaways there was um, really depends on the application. And if you're not familiar with it, it's just a, a framework that allows you to port uh, like web languages, so your markup scripts, you know, style sheets, and so on, into native applications. You can get the, you know, you can get the hardware or the sensors on the hardware um, you know, through, the, through, that, uh, through that framework. Now, as, as mentioned, we have an API as well. Um, and this is one of the sort of key things you know, to communicate uh, uh, today. Um, it's took kind of two core elements. Um, so we have kind of essentially an augmentation layer on top of the Google Places API. So any call that's made to our API, we're in turn calling the Google Places API and then looking up to see if we have data, any accessibility data on that particular venue. And if we do, then we return that on top. I've just got a little sort of snippet of the, of the JSON uh, response that we inject in uh, there. So things like you know, all the kind of uh, things that you saw earlier, so getting in the, the one to five and restrooms, you know, one to five and so on. Uh, and key takeaway is we'd love to share this. So if there's, uh, you know, if there's any need to embed you know, accessibility information into your applications, you know, feel free to reach out to us. My email address is up there and you know, feel free to come, uh, come and chat after, because um, you know, we'd love to, you know, integrate this into apps. One of the kind of goals, as Jason mentioned at the start. Uh, just to close, um, an upcoming release. Uh, we have an immediate term release uh, where we're going to be embedding photo uh, or adding photo upload uh, and richer filters, um, which allow you to kind of take pictures of key accessibility points you know, as you're going out and kind of mapping um, cities or, sorry, venues within cities and so on. And then in terms of the filters as well, so you can actually kind of query it to say, you know, show me you know, a venue that has, say, Braille menus in a, you know, in a 50 meter radius around me. Um, we also have a number of tweaks and so on around the accessibility of the app that we're going to be releasing. And on the right-hand side of this screen, we've um, or I've just embed, um, added a number of the kind of more blue sky things that we'd you know, like to do in the kind of more medium term, uh, medium to long term. Uh, so first one there is visualization. So like, an, sort of being able to answer questions such as how accessible is your, ne your neighborhood or your city, being able to compare those, it'll be you know, a big win for us. And as we're building this data set, that's, that's becoming something feasible that we can actually start to, to answer. Uh, in the top right there, we've got augmented reality. So we actually kind of did build a quick prototype of uh, an AR interface. So you can kind of, you know, I'm sure you've all seen the kind of cool demos there. Uh, but in this case, you can actually see the venues you know, hovering around you and their degree of accessibility. So that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, and then finally, kind of just gamification, so adding sort of game mechanics and uh, incentivization mechanics to, um, uh, you know, to the application just to you know, make it a little bit more sticky. <clears throat> so that's it from me. Um, yeah, so as I said, definitely reach out after. You know, we'd love to chat and uh, you know, look at maybe you know, getting accessibility into your applications. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Jake Wall from uh, Save the Elephants. So thanks very much. <laughs>
So good afternoon. Um, where is that? There we go. So my name is Jake Wall, and I'm a researcher from a group called Save the Elephants in Kenya. Um, so Save the Elephants is primarily a conservation group, but with a strong focus on scientific research. For the last 15 years, our group has been studying elephants, and through the lens of science, we're trying to paint a picture of what elephants need to survive on this planet. A central focus has been on movement ecology of elephants and includes looking at home range, migratory patterns, and other spatial behavior. And to do this, we do a lot of mapping. Um, so to follow the movements of elephants, we use GPS tracking collars, uh, which we fit around the neck of an elephant. It's basically an indestructible box. It carries a GPS receiver, lithium battery, and since 2004, it carries a cell phone. And here you can see a bull elephant called Jaeger uh, sniffing old collars in our camp. Um, so the elephant needs to be tranquilized in order to fit the collar. Once a collar's been put on, though, it can generally last for up to five years, and it takes positions generally every hour. So think of your cell phone making a call every hour for five years. <laughs> um, the real-time tracking has opened up all kinds of new opportunities for elephant conservation. And today I'm going to show you the system that we built to track elephants in real time. So first I want to mention three of the challenges to our system. One was that the data had to be secure. So um, we needed password authentication. Because of the poaching that's going on now of African elephants, there's a real threat to elephants if this information would to, was to get out. The second is that the data needed to be as real-time as possible. So for management or conservation action, we need data as it occurs. Um, and the third was that there's multiple tiers of users of our system. So on one side, we have scientific researchers who need the data as it is, as it comes off the elephant. And on the other side, there's members of the public who maybe are interested in education um, and learning about elephants, but don't need the actual real-time location of elephants. So our, we had to build the system to encompass all of that. So here is our tracking system. Um, it's a little confusing. <laughs> um, basically, on the left side, we have our data inputs. So these are collars, so elephants wearing collars. Um, here we have a cloud server, which ingests the data. Uh, we store it in a Postgres database. And then on the right side, we have users. So we've got different so wildlife managers, rangers, an administrator, a researcher. Um, so Animal Link is our primary software that ingests data from the different callers. Um, and then we have a movement monitor software, or events monitor software, which looks for anything strange with the data. So it can alert us if an elephant stopped moving uh, or has crossed a fence line, et cetera. So there are, there are several different tasks that it performs. So what I'll do is walk you through the lifetime of a GPS fix from the caller to uh, our system and to the user. So it starts out, so if, say we've got a caller here um, on an elephant and it takes a fix. It sends that fix via the local cell phone network in Kenya, uh, via TCP IP, and then our Animal Link software is listening on that port, and it ingests any data that it, it reads in from that port, and it stores it in the animal tracking database. Um, it then tries to parse the data for coordinates and stores the location data into the animal tracking database. At this point, users of Google Earth um, can query our KML tracking service, which is running. Um, and so any, any user of Google Earth can connect via the tracking service, which then queries the database and turns the raw uh, coordinate data into KML and sends it back to the user, like that. Um, so we're using a Windows Communication Foundation data contract as, as the basis for this. So here we have two, we have a, what's called a data structure service and a tracking service. So the data structure service defines the number of nodes in the uh, 
tree, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, whereas the tracking service is what actually gives you real-time tracking data. So within our system, um, Google Earth has become an essential geovisualization tool. Although it might seem a simple idea, a transformation of raw coordinates into a movement trajectory that can be visualized and replayed in the context of terrain, vegetation, and human infrastructure is an incredibly powerful tool. This wasn't at all easy until the release of Google Earth in 2005, and we've had a close partnership with Google since then. As Rebecca said, seeing is believing, so I'm not gonna show you a live demo of our tracking service. So. Switch over now to Google Earth. Okay. So here is our tracking service. Um, and this is all coming live from our cloud server. So when I click on this link, it's going to generate KML. And you saw how quickly that was. So that's querying the database. And it's creating KML tracks for all these elephants in real time. Um, so let me, and we're not just confined to elephants, actually. We've got a number of different species. But I'll show you one of our elephants. So we're going to look now at an elephant called Mountain Bull, who's become famous recently as he was the star of a BBC film. Um, and here he is. So if I click on his data, and I can, and this is all temporal data, so I can use the time slider feature. And so this is the real-time location, so within the last hour. So we're zoomed into an area of Kenya right now. Um, and he's actually some really interesting behavior here. What he's done is he walk, he's walked up to this is the main Cape to Cairo highway. And he, you can see how he's hit the highway and he's come back from it. And he's probably going to wait until nighttime before he crosses that highway. Um, so that's the, the real-time location of a bull elephant in Kenya at this moment. Um, so an interesting note about this elephant and why I chose him was that a few years ago, he was accused of um, crop raiding. So in Kenya right now, there's a, there's a problem with human-wildlife conflict and wildlife living on the margins of places where people are growing crops and so on. And Mountain Bull was accused of crop raiding. And we quickly got onto Google Earth and were able to pull up his track. And the Kenya Wildlife Service, in, in certain cases, has the option to destroy an animal if they found that they've been very uh, um, harmful to people. But we were able to get onto Google Earth and check out his track and prove that he was not the elephant in question, that he had been nowhere near the farms in question. And so we got him off the hook. And uh, he lives to this day. So that was. Very good. <laughs> um, so let me switch back. And there's Mountain Bull. That, so that's the bull you've just seen. Um, so our KML tracking service is therefore used by everyone from rangers on patrol in Kenya to researchers studying behavior in a university and has become an essential conservation tool. Globally, technology is playing a bigger role in wildlife conservation and management. Software, databases, and sensors are the new notebook, pen, and binoculars for field work. Through continued partnership with companies like Google that have a global conscience and the resources to make things happen, we hope to continue to save elephants together. Thank you. And I'll pass it back to Rebecca. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, I, I think about Brian McClendon, you know, one of the inventors of Keyhole that became Google Earth. Would he have ever imagined that a few years in the future it would be used to save an elephant from uh, being falsely accused of crop crime? <laughs> so we're going to end by announcing uh, here today the 2012 round of Google Earth Outreach developer grants. Here's how it works. Um, you are uh, the grants are in the range of ten to twenty thousand dollars. The goal is to help support developers and nonprofits in building cutting-edge applications that both drive uh, the state of the art of, of mapping technology 
and also advance uh, some public benefit uh, purpose uh, in a new way. So how does it work? The, it's actually the nonprofit organizations who apply. Uh, we have found that the ones that are most successful in getting approved actually have a relationship with the developer. Uh, so they're able to put together a thoughtful application. The funding that goes to those uh, grants that are awarded is 100% dedicated to the developers. Um, so what, would you, what should you do? Well, if you already have some kind of relationship with a nonprofit organization, you have an idea together of something you might want to work on, by all means encourage uh, them and work with them to put together a proposal. The deadline is August 1st uh, for this round. If you don't specifically have a project in mind or a relationship with a nonprofit, but you're interested in working in this space, we highly encourage you to register yourself, your portfolio, your skills, your interests in our developer marketplace. This is where we direct nonprofits, nonprofits to go when they're looking for a developer. I'll show you more about that in a second. For those of you who are here, um, at I.O., please come talk to us at the Develop for Good booth um, that's right nearby here on floor two. And you can meet with our team. Uh, you can talk with Jake and Kevin uh, and uh, get more information and maybe brainstorm ideas for this round of grants. So getting in the developer marketplace, there's the URL. This is on our Earth Outreach site. It's a pretty straightforward process. We're going to fast track those applications uh, uh, developer marketplace applications that are coming in now so that you can be in there for nonprofits in this round of grants uh, to consider your services. So with that, um, thank you very much for, for coming to, to Maps for Good. And uh, hopefully you're a little bit inspired to help make the world a better place through mapping. Please join me in thanking everyone on the panel. We do have a few minutes uh, if you have questions. Yes. We have a lot of orthographic data uh, that we've paid for. And is it possible to submit that into the uh, database that Google has? Yeah, a um, couple options there. One is Maps Engine, which is hosting your data in the cloud. Uh, so if you are a nonprofit, you can apply for a free grant of Google Maps Engine and upload your own data. If you want to contribute it to Google, there are ways to do that, um, to contribute data. And, and we can talk more about that offline if you want. Great. Um, the second question is, do you support LiDAR data? Uh, depends what you mean by support. Uh, it, so in Google Earth Engine, so, so LiDAR data, when it's originally captured, it's this 3D point cloud. But that's often not what people do the analysis on you can convert that 3D point cloud into a raster data set. And yes, that raster data set can be uh, analyzed in Earth Engine. So we would need to convert it to the raster data set. Yeah. Our... OK, yep. thank you. For now. OK, okay. this is yes. Hoeing from Hong Kong. Uh, I would like to know if there is any restriction for the NGOs. Do they need to reside in the States, or can be all over the world? Uh, it's a great question. Um, we, as we launch Google Earth Outreach in different countries, we need to determine what constitutes a legally registered charity in that country. So for now, we've launched in uh, the US, Brazil, all over Europe, all over Africa. Um, we have some launches coming up in, in Asia uh, later this year. Uh, but if you go to our Earth Outreach site, you can see which countries we're launched in. Uh, can, can this year, like uh, the, 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 the coverage will cover Hong Kong, or I cannot? Huh? Be go to go for the proposal before the deadline this year. Uh, I'm sorry. Did did anyone understand the question? Uh, Could you sorry, the question? because you said the deadline for this year is August the first. Oh so yes. So yeah, if you are not running out in Hong Kong, then I cannot go for this year. Yeah. Uh, if you can be affiliated with a nonprofit that is in any of our currently supported countries, that's that would be the best approach. Okay. Thank yeah. you. But next year there will be more countries. So. Okay. Any other questions? Feel free, don't be shy. 
Yes. Uh, if you could go to the to the mic, please. Thanks. Do we come to you at the uh, booth if we're a nonprofit who's interested in the program and? Not Absolutely. Currently? Okay, perfect. Please come talk to us. We're happy to give you advice on which applications um, are most powerful, the kinds of, kind of things we're looking for. But there's also good guidance on that online. Yes, another question. Um, a lot of the work you presented for obvious reasons is, is very focused on environmental issues. Yes. Uh, except, of course, the accessibility becomes somewhat broader. And so yes. uh, in my research life, I'm a psychology and social sciences person. And there's all sorts of cool things I can think to do with maps that yes. isn't so much detailed satellite analysis. Yes. But boy, I could think of how I could incorporate that and do something cool. So do you get a lot of connection with, with nonprofits that are working outside yes. of traditional geospatial? I mean, I wish we had all day, because there are so many applications in the social science area. There's human rights, humanitarian relief. People are doing demographic studies. Um, and if you go to our Earth Outreach site and you look under success stories and case studies, you will see a lot of examples that are that are in the social science uh, area as well. Um, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Yes. Hey. I'm a developer from Brazil. I'm getting the question via my bon cell phone right now. Or bon dia. Bon dia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In Brazil, it's boa tarde, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my my associate is asking if the NGOs that that wants to apply to this project they can be I don't know. Any, the, the, they need to be an old and already established NGO or a brand new NGO may apply in Brazil? Um, as long as you're a registered, and actually I know in, in Brazilian Portuguese it's ONG. Yes. NGO is ONG. It's, it's, my mind is always uh, yes, backwards here. <laughs> yeah, as it doesn't matter how long you've been a registered uh, charity. Okay. You can be new. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh -huh. In fact, I will say that we often find the most nimble projects and ideas are coming from those small, small uh, nonprofits. Hi, I've been working on something similar uh, to Access Map, getting it off the ground in the Netherlands. Uh, so I definitely want to talk to you sure. later. Yeah. Um, a question we've been getting is how to ensure the continuity. Uh, how to? Do, are you purely? grant dependent, uh, or do you have some way to get money from the users, or? Uh, 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 in terms of uh, profitability, and uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a number of models we've been exploring, and we, could, we can chat more deeply offline for sure, um, but yeah, it got kicked off with the grants, um, and then we've been looking at some models of sort of sponsored venues, featured venues, um, and also um, mapping days where people raise money and perhaps like similar to kind of a walkathon style thing where people raise money and some of that I'd like to say a percentage of that money would go to the organization to make it sustainable as well as obviously the other money going towards you know charities and so on so there's been exploring a number of different models okay thank you okay good questions yes do your grants touch anything political like voter registration Oh, I might have to get our, uh, our, our, our grants person, but I, I, do you know the answer to that? Okay, so as long as they're a registered 501c3, and once you're a 501c3, that means you're not doing political advocacy, whatever. Um, as long as you meet that criterion, yes, you're eligible. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Tanya Birch, you should stand up. Tanya Birch is a program manager on Google Earth Outreach, and she, spearheads our grants program, including the developer grants. Other questions? What are you going to do to change the world today? <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks very much, everyone.